So um, let's talk a little bit about toxic worry versus productive worry. So we know, uh, we know that nervousness is an uncertainty that diminishes when you learn a skill. So you're nervous about maybe doing a presentation at work, but when you've actually done that presentation at work once, you know, your nervousness kind of diminishes. It's like stage fright. Once you've gotten out there, you know, you're a little more confident. Hi, Susan, welcome. Hi, Simone. Um, so worry, however, is expecting a negative outcome. So nervousness will, will sort of, you know, kind of turn itself down over time when you're, you're comfortable and you've learned the skill and um, it's easy for you, it's easier for you uh, to, to actually do the, do the task. Worrying, however, is expecting a negative outcome. So you're pretty sure that whatever you're thinking about, the bad things, the what ifs are going to happen. And anxiety is a condition of over responding to fear or worry. So um, uh, we worriers, we turn what ifs into believable situations. So worry is about um, how we think of something. And anxiety is our physiological response based on the triggers. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. And thank you, Karen. I'm with you. I know. I do it more than I would like. So here's the flip side is that we warriors are actually really good planners. We have future focused thinking and creative ways of seeing things. So um, when we are talking about toxic worry, however, um, what we want to really understand is that toxic worry is what I call poisonous worry also. And it's about things you can't control. Um, thunderstorms, whether people will like you, if the plane will crash, will you have good weather on your vacation? It can make you feel and sound like you're crazy because toxic worry replays in your brain over and over again. Productive worry is about doing things like your homework, getting to work on time, remembering to charge your phone. Productive worry contributes to the helpful planning side of anxiety. It can be motivating and you're anticipating dangers. So what is anxiety? So anxiety is, is a, a, a pattern um, that we have in our, in, in, the, in, our, in our being that has a physiological aspect, that stress response, that amygdala fight, flight, or freeze, a psychological component, that ne negative thinking and negative expectation, and an emotional component of fear. So um, anxiety, usually um, when we have symptoms of anxiety, what we're, what, we're, uh, what we're showing are scanning for threats, catastrophizing, what if thoughts and worries, unreliable emotional messages, and interpreting predictions as fact. Now we all receive information from our bodies about anxiety physiological information, as I said, those uncomfortable bodily states, that tightness in your stomach, or maybe in your chest, or you get a headache, you get a dry mouth, your palms start um, getting hot. Um, uh, cognitively, that worried thinking I was talking about, and psychologically or emotionally, it's the distorted beliefs and the emotional dis uh, discomfort that comes with them, that fear. Um, anxiety is part of how we've survived as a species and it's often adaptive and it helps prepare our bodies for real danger. Our muscles tighten, our breath gets more shallow, we might perspire to cool us off. We're ready, we're ready for that tiger. You know, it's gonna, that, that, that you know, turn comes around the bend and we know what to do in response. But today, the anxiety that we experience is not usually because there's a tiger in our way. It's a false alarm. These are episodes of fear or worry, it, perhaps in absence of a genuine threat. But sometimes there's a real concern. But the reaction is disproportionate to the event itself.
Now, um, there's a difference between real danger. Oh, whoops, that car, I'm stepping to cross the street and that car is coming at me really fast. And a perceived danger that spider that's the size of uh, of, of less than a, you know a dime, well, let's say like a, the, the the point of a pen, is crawling on the top of my ceiling, and you know it could crawl down and bite me, and I would die. So anxiety reflects this all or nothing thinking and a negative expectancy, and we have to learn how to distinguish between these position these perceptions. So the first thing that we want to do is to name our worry. Are we, do we have productive worries and or toxic worries? What is the worry that we have? And I'd love to tell you a little story if you don't mind. So my husband and I went, uh, we had a beautiful week of vacation in Montana at Glacier National Park. And we had to drive from Flathead Lake to the airport in Missoula which was about an hour and a half. And um, the, the airport in Missoula is quite small. I think there's maybe five gates, um, which I had sussed out when we arrived because I do that kind of thing. And I don't think my husband had really paid attention. And so he was very worried that we were gonna get to the airport late. And so we stopped to get, get some breakfast. I wanted to get a salad for my lunch. He said, no, don't worry, we, we don't have time. You know, I got a coffee. I wanted it, you know, with my almond milk. And he's like, oh my God, would you just order your coffee? So we get in the car, we drive to the airport. And when we're about maybe 10 minutes away from the airport, I say, hey, you know what? I still am gonna want some lunch. Let's stop and get a salad. And he said, well, I don't think we have time. And I said, it's 1145 and our plane leaves at 145. We have time because this airport is quite small. We're gonna be fine. But he didn't feel that way because he has worry about you know, arriving places on time. That's not my worry. And his worry generally is productive because he is a backwards, he thinks in terms of backwards design. He's like, okay, our flight is here. I have to, you know, if flight's at 145, I should arrive at 1245, um, but we have to return the car. So now it's 1230, et cetera. In this particular airport, everything was very close together and the car return was like a three minute walk from the entrance of the airport. So um, I said, yes, I still want to get my salad because, you know, we're flying and I get hungry and then I am get like headaches and cranky. So I don't do that. So he's like, oh, my God, we hardly have time. So he starts speeding and then we get pulled over by a police officer. So now we actually are starting to run into that extra time that we had. And the police officer pulls us over and he asks for the, our, you know, his, my husband's license and registration. It's a rental car. And he gives him the rental agreement. And my husband says, we have a flight. It leaves at 145. And the officer goes away. And my husband is clearly, you know, fuming while the officer's in his car checking my husband's license or whatever. And he's so mad at me. And I'm just trying not to take it on because I know that we have plenty of time because this isn't my area of anxiety. So then the officer comes back and he said, it's your lucky day. I'm only giving tickets to people who are going 15 miles over the speed limit and you are going 10. And I thought, well, that's also because we're older and we're white. But of course, I didn't say that because I wanted to get out of the situation. So then he lets us go. And my husband said, do you still want your salad? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> so we go to the Chipotle and... Um, I, you know, he, does, he doesn't want anything. And I walk in and there's a line and I say to the second people in line, could I get in front of you? Uh, we have a flight and we were stopped by the police and we're running late. And the people said, oh, that was you. Of course you can. So I got my salad. We went back to the airport. We made it through. No problem. And we had at least 50 minutes until the flight left. So the reason I'm telling you this story is because this is how productive anxiety can go awry. And a lot of times we think, you know, productive anxiety, that's good. It motivates me. I'm going to get to places on time. I'm going to get things done. But it can actually shift into some toxic um, worry, right? That productive worry shifts into toxic worry. Um, um, I don't know, uh, um, Deborah's saying seriously. You know, I don't know. I just know that I was uh, freed to not uh, get a ticket by this police officer. Um, 
So I can't say, but it was for some reason that happened. And I'm sure it was because we were out of staters and in a rental car and we looked okay. And probably because we were white, because in the United States, people of color and Caucasian people are not treated necessarily the same by law enforcement, uh, which has been proven after study, study after study. Anyway, I wanna go back to toxic worry. So my worry is completely different. Like I'm not worried about, you know, getting to the airport or, you know, uh, that kind of thing. I worry about things I cannot control. Like, will, um, will this Facebook Live go well today? I don't know. Will uh, people read my book? I'm not sure. You know, um, how, how will I, um, how will I, how will I uh, create a good training? You know, these are the things I worry about. And none of them are necessarily in my control. Like, will I create a good training or not? Maybe. I mean, I'm going to do my best and I have to let it go. But toxic worry really has to do with um, that feeling of vulnerability and less control about an issue or a situation. It's tough to manage fe your feelings of uncertainty and, and you have discomfort. It's difficult to reduce them. So, you know, I'm, I might be I am worried about one of my kids and there's nothing really I can do about that. They live 3000 miles away and they don't really want to sort of listen to what I have to say. But I'm super worried about how they're doing and the fact that they're not doing well. And this kind of eats away at me. And that is actually toxic worry. It's also how a loving mother lives their lives, but it isn't helpful. But productive worry, you know, um, helps you facilitate your problem, helps you facilitate problem solving because you're increasing your focus on brainstorming and, and, and useful ideas or figuring out solutions. Um, you can control those productive worries because you focus on things you can influence and release the fantasy of having control. But with per toxic worry, the symptoms of toxic worry um, are, you know, you're tired, you have trouble sleeping, you, that's the 3 a.m. I'm worrying about stuff, agitation, headaches, nausea, avoiding things that trigger worry or trying to control situations. Whereas productive worry, it's like, okay, well, my flight leaves at 1.45, so I need to be at the airport at 12.30. How, what, how am I going to make sure I'm at the airport at 12.30? So it, these are different. Toxic worry is like, how can I make sure that my daughter is making good choices? I can't, um, but I'm going to worry that she's not making good choices. I can't do anything about that either. So it, it's really interesting to be able to identify your worries, what's toxic and what is actually productive. Now, how do we reduce toxic worry? So before I get into that, I want to go to... Um, some of the comments here. So thank you um, for, for, for contributing. Um, uh, let's see, um, I'm training myself to live in the moment, says Mike, so I don't have to worry about the what ifs by doing mindful meditation. So meditation actually, um, meditation or any kind of, a, you know, sort of mindful awareness is very helpful for, the, for, for toxic worry. And, you know, sometimes that, you know, racing productive worry, but it's very helpful for toxic worry because it takes us from up here in our head and sort of panicking to actually slowing our system down, breathing and being able to gain some perspective. Um, I often recommend when you're in a toxic worry sort of loop to practice what I call triangle breathing. Breathe in for four, hold for four, and exhale slowly for six. Because what's happening in a toxic worry loop, and someone said, I think, racing thoughts, okay, um, is that... Um, uh, and then catastrophi catastrophizing is that um, your your stress response, your your amygdala has now taken over. So your thinking brain is kind of been 
pushed aside and that 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 part of us that you know basically runs from tigers or figures out how to um, step aside when there's a racing car um, is 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 running the ship that we call ourselves and we need that to kind of step back in you know sit back into the into the back seat and let our cognitive brain our prefrontal cortex go back to kind of driving uh the, driving or shepherding the ship so um, Monica says I'm in a bit of um, Monica says I'm in a bit of the middle of toxic worry re R E career and young adult autistic son absolutely so we have as a lot of us who those of us who are parents may have toxic worry about what's going to happen to our kids you know how how they can make good choices. Um, Will they be able to support themselves? And a lot of questions that we probably don't have any control over and don't have the answer to. And so we need to learn how to manage those worries or convert them into something that's more productive. Because just like productive worry can, you know, um, in stressful situations can lead toward uh, toxicity, toxic worry can also be transformed into something productive when you're not in a loop, when you are able to kind of get that space and brainstorm possible solutions. Um, Sonia says, I procrastinate so much that hardly anything productive gets done. Okay, um, we can talk about that. My, my concentration is bad that despite um, having bought 15 books on ADHD, I haven't read a single one. My mind races constantly. So, Sonia, what I would encourage you to do then is to try to get the information in a different um, a different way. Podcasts, there are some great podcasts out there. Attitudes webinars, and I think some of their webinars are now podcasts. So those are great ways to get the information in a different way. Uh, sort of modality. Yes, Paul, you can. Triangle breathing really helps me to fall asleep at night. I focus on my breathing and the counting instead of the intrusive thoughts. That's exactly right, Sue. You want to do that triangle breathing so you're focusing on breathing in for four, counting, holding for four, counting, exhaling for six, counting, and do several rounds of this. So how do we reduce toxic worry and increase a sense of security? So the first thing that we wanna do is identify our toxic worries. If you're willing to, could you please put in the chat some of the toxic worries that you may have? I'm gonna put in the chat again, my handout for those of you who are just joining. Um, uh, um, okay, so what are some of the toxic worries that you have? Um, Michelle says toxic worry as a parent is a hard one to control. Here, here. Um, but accepting my son as is instead of what if happens. That's right. We want to meet our kids where we are. We want to meet ourselves where we are. Instead of me, me worrying, like what's going to happen um, if so and so uh, gets sick when we have this, uh, you know, event planned. I can't control that. What I have to lean on is my ability to pivot that I've used in the past and to let go and trust that I'll be able to figure it out. Fabiola says, um, I worry constantly about my health. Um, thank you for sharing that, Fabiola. Um, you may have health issues which would you know substantiate that worry but sometimes we get into a loop about you know oh my gosh you know my cholesterol is over 200 what does that mean am i my blood pressure is at 225 am i going to have a heart attack you know we can kind of run these worst case scenarios and and we want to really be able to identify what our toxic worries are, because then we're going to work on how to deal with them. If we don't identify them, we can't work with them. Okay, so let's see. Um, there's something will happen in a store I'm in. This world is crazy. Understandable. Yes, something could happen. You don't know that. Um, you could spend your life at home, so you never have to go to a store, or you can you know, figure out what are the risks of leaving your house. And, and a lot of times probability can be very helpful when dealing with toxic worry because probability um, is actually about reality testing and facts. 
Deb, my husband's mental state is really dementia. Fair enough. That sounds like a tough call. Mike, I'm finishing my degree this fall because my ADHD, predominantly inattentive, which has an anxiety component, is being better managed than I ever thought possible due to medicine, diet changes, and other lifestyle changes. I haven't felt this sort of relief ever in my life. Woo, Mike! Yay, that's fantastic. Way to go. Aris, I worry excessively about not being successful in my chosen field. Right, so I want to say something about this worry about success. So, you know, I think there are two parts of that. One is, what is the definition of success that is, is kind of, you know, poisoning your brain? What are you holding on to that's a definition of success that may not actually be relevant to you or your life? Whose standards of success are you using? Are they actually those that are internal to you or things that you imported from family or your culture? Um, worrying about success means putting the control about what's happening to you outside of yourself. And what I would like to see people do is, wor is worry about what am I doing in a day to day that's meeting the goals that I have for myself and satisfying um, um, my hopes um, in terms of the kind of worker I want to be. Alethea, older parents, health, memory care. Of course, that's a worry. Um, and, and the question is, is that worry keeping you up at night? Or is that worry actually helping you make choices with them about their care? Now, for me, you know, I have elderly parents and um, both, neither of them is particularly interested in my feedback about their health care. And so, um, which is hard because I worry about things like my 89 year old father driving or, um, you know, my mom who is ill, you know, dying as well. I can't control these things. And so if I spend time worrying about them, it's only going to upset me. What I can do is to sh maybe share my concern and then they'll let me know what they feel like doing or they don't. And that's it, right? That's it. And this is part of the challenge of worry because worry is about our vulnerability and our lack of control. That's anxiety. Vulnerability plus lack of control will often equal toxic worry. Elaine, I worry about illness that will render me dependent. I hear you. Uh, Jamie, in your opinion, what's the difference between executive functioning issues and toxic worry? So we're not really talking about executive functioning issues specifically today, except for one or two. And the executive functioning uh, issues that are really affected by toxic worry, well, maybe three, um, would be impulse control. Because when you're activated, uh, when you're in a high alert situ when you're in a high alert status, you're more likely to act, act impulsively that you will regret. Two, emotional dysregulation, which I spoke about before, that um, people with ADHD struggle with emotional regulation. So it's already challenging for them to kind of manage strong emotions, a stress response, an amygdala takeover, you know, intense sadness. So that is part of this. And I think the third thing would be working memory because emotional control and working memory are innately tied. Because what happens is that when we're distressed, we, can, we have struggled to call up times in the past when we succeeded in spite of our distress, right? And we kind of, we, we can sink into this big feeling that it's not going to work out. Um, and so that is something um, that, uh, we, that people with ADHD really struggle with. I worry that I will never get my back taxes done. Nadine, I hear you. Step by step, make a plan, get an accountant, get somebody to help you. Jerry, I worry about how people perceive me constantly and I feel like I'm not good enough. So Jerry, I did a webinar earlier this year for Attitude on Social Anxiety. I encourage you to check that out because this is also um, this worry about how people are going to perceive you and what they'll think about you is a very common and quite toxic worry for people who struggle with social anxiety. Um, the feeling good enough is, 
is a feeling state that goes along with that. Like somehow you don't have enough confidence or self-esteem or think you're worthy, but that, um, and that kind of, these kind of come together and it can be in, incapacitating. Alethea, also young children's lives and needs. Yep, people worry about that. Sonia worries whether my two sons who both have ASD will be able to support themselves when they're older. Right, and so the, um, the productive side of that worry is to teach them the skills that they need and to give them a longer lead time. But it's gonna take them longer than it will take a neurotypical child or teen um, to become um, more self-sufficient adults. Binge eating. Yep, that's a that's a coping mechanism that isn't super effective, but people do it. I have chronic fatigue, which causes me problems with exercising, which in effect stresses me out due to struggling to lose weight. I worry about calories every single day. I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, um, I think that uh, you know maybe to um, to have small small bits of exercise through the course of the day rather than aiming for a large exercise. You know, maybe you walk 10 minutes down the block and back, and then you do that two or three times a day. Because worrying about your calories, it keeps you, keeps you not in the present. So that's the thing about toxic worry and productive worry, actually. Both of these things are future focused. And so they take the strength that um, people with anxiety have of future focused thinking and, and they kind of corrupt it in a way. Uh, Deb, ADHD medicine, worry about chronic pain. My not working anymore will adversely affect my family. I quit working a few years ago before my anxiety. I'm sorry to hear that, Sue. Uh, Monica, I found pre and probiotics to be helping. Great. Um, Sonia, anyone else finding ADHD medicine doesn't help? So ADHD medication doesn't work for everyone. Um, some of the non-stimulants can be helpful in um, particularly for inattentive ADHD and anxiety. But sometimes what's most helpful in terms of medication for anxiety are the SSRIs, things like Prozac or Lexapro or Celexa. Elaine, I worry about... Um, my daughter's health and the possibility of something serious. That's because I lost my son 12 years ago to leukemia. I'm so sorry. I tend to be hyper vigilant about all my loved ones. I drive them crazy. Well, of course you do because you're worried and, uh, and, and want to avoid the pain that you experienced. You know, when you have a tragedy like this, um, you have experienced a profound trauma. Um, I would encourage you to maybe think about finding a therapist who does EMDR. Um, it's very helpful for trauma um, and uh, that could be useful for you. Emma Jean, as a 62 year old grandma, I worry about my two grandkids I am raising, both with special needs and being able to be capable adults. I worry about being here for them as long as I can. Sure you do. And again, you know, your, your job is to set up set up that village around them and do your best um, as you can to, to, to teach them the skills they need um, day in and day out. And, and know that you're doing your best. And whatever you're doing, Emma Jean, is in them. It's, it's in them. I'm sure they carry it around. Um, Sonia, I worry about other people's problems. That's a toxic worry because you can't fix them. Um, and that would be something that would be easy to easier to let go of because you draw a boundary. RS, ruminating on certain events, how I could have done things differently. Yeah, so that's something that um, happens to a lot of people with ADHD and that is kind of a form, a little bit of social anxiety, but it's really, uh, you know, a sense of, it's kind of this combined thing of like, ugh, I wish I hadn't said that. So I'm judging myself. That's that social anxiety piece. And I'm projecting onto others. This is also the social anxiety piece, like what they're thinking about me, which I'm sure is negative because of my, you know, insecurity or low self-esteem. So that those things can actually all work together to be um, really um, immobilizing. And so what we want to do is to be able to be present in those moments as much as we can and not focus on what other people are thinking, but actually what we're witnessing around us, what we're seeing, what we're, how we decide to participate um, and what's happening. 
All right, let me go into some ways to reduce toxic um, worry. Um, so we want to identify it, and then we want to learn how to manage it. So this means creating a plan to navigate perceived dangerous waters and rely on past successes, tools, interventions, statements we've said to ourselves to overcome your worries. So this is about developing a method for approaching and dismantling worry that includes turning down the volume of the voice of the negative expectations and the intense fear and talking back to that voice with what could go right. So that's something that I've started to do with myself when I'm in a very, when I'm in a what if spiral like this could happen or that could happen. What I shift instead to is what could go right? What could go right? And that is hard to do, but it's actually kind of freeing because, and sometimes I can only think of one thing. Well, this one thing might go right and that's okay. I can only think of one thing, but I've identified one thing. So I'd like you to really think about that. Asking yourself probability, what could go right? What can I say back to that neg that th those negative expectations? Often, if we follow our what ifs to the end of the line, like what if this happened? And then I would ask, and then what? And what if that happened? And then what? And you kind of keep going. You see, you get to the end of the line and something occurs. There's something, there's some resolution. And the question is, can you live with that resolution? Can you tolerate that resolution? Is that resolution, you know, absurd? Um, so we want to be able to follow things down that line. So toxic worry intensifies when people are alone. So we want to set up a buddy system with someone you trust. Like if you're in a spiral, who could you contact? Could you text? Could you call? Do you have a therapist or a coach or a counselor that you could work with to set up a plan for those moments when you're in a downward spiral? Um, so is your down are your is your downward spiral is your toxic worry related to issues of perfectionism, social anxiety, uh, issues with socioeconomic, racial or gender injustices? Who is your ally in these dark moments? Because we want to identify who that person is and what the plan is for yourself. And maybe there, that involves another person, maybe it doesn't. But for a lot of people, because toxic worry gets stronger when you're alone, we want to bring in someone who can offer a different perspective. One thing that I find is helpful for a lot of my clients is to use your phone to on your notes to create um, a note on what to do when I'm in a spiral. And there can be a list of things. It could be calm me down phrases. It could be a list of activities that help you settle, breathing, walking, um, getting fresh air, drinking a glass of water, um, you know, leaving the house and getting a coffee, um, petting your cat or your dog, um, getting a hug, whatever it is. So we wanna put those down. And I do want to make sure that on your list, you have some kind of exercise. Daily exercise, and some of you can't do this because of your physical state, but any kind of daily exercise helps get endorphins in your brain. And those endorphins bathe your brain in that feeling good. And we want that. We want that. I know that um, for me, you know, I can wake up in the morning and feel kind of like, Bleh. and then I like to exercise in the morning. So I'll go for um, a run or a bike ride or a walk my, with my dog. And something shifts while I'm doing this. I enjoy the outside, I get out of my head. It's very helpful. Um, and you could create a playlist of songs that you like on your phone so you can listen to that. You know, maybe angry songs, sad songs, happy songs, um, how to stop worrying songs. Um, yoga, meditation, a nice cup of tea or coffee, just listen to the birds or do the crossword puzzle or play Wordle, something that can break the pattern, okay? So we want to use reality testing with a buddy or follow worry to its illogical end. Um, routines and structure can lower uncertainty, um, but you want to remain flexible without developing rigidity, okay? 
So use humor with yourself and of course, self-compassion. You're not supposed to be perfect. I have here a quote from Maya Angelou. It's one of my favorites. Um, for, forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it. Blaming yourself um, for things that you've done in the past or things that you're not able to do and worrying if you can do them is really a form of self-cruelty. And that's not how we want to treat our third grader in here. We want to treat him or her or them with love and compassion. Um, so ultimately, the best interventions for toxic worries are figuring out how to release them back into the wild so you're not carrying them around. Um, hopefully, these interventions can help you with that. And there are a number of great comments that I missed while I was uh, giving my little teaching. So let me just, I'm just going to pick up where I where, where we left off. Advice on how to manage when you are always trying to make your toxic worry not to by constantly solving problems, ah, using your parent example, buying a medic alert, brackets, reading how to have difficult conversations, lots of work, you know, won't go anywhere, but you have to try. So Lauren, this is a great question. My answer would be pick one thing. Start with one thing you can do and do that and, you know, see how that goes. Because what happens, toxic worry is a fierce competitor, fierce. Like, I, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of the fencing metaphor, like, like suit up, <laughs> you know? So we don't want to set unrealistic expectations for ourselves because what happens is perfectionism will often feed toxic worry. Sometimes perfectionism can feed, you know, productive worry because we want to, you know, do it. We want to get something done and do a good job. But again, it can cross that crossover quickly into a dangerous neighborhood. Staying active. Yes, Mike. Um, Simone, I found it really difficult to explain this to my son who is eight and has ADHD and has a lot of toxic worries and anxiety, which is hard to deal with for him and me. Right. So with younger children, what I think about is the worry monster. And I, I we, 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 we might draw the worry monster. We describe the worry monster. Um, and um, we might want to uh, figure out together, like how to put your arm around him and say, okay, worry monster, you're rearing your ugly head. This is what we've planned to talk back to you. Um, when kids have worries like this, persistent worries, it's because they feel out of control about something. So we want to help them define what they're out of control about and what are small steps for gaining control in that area. And that's true for all of us. We need some small steps to gain control so we feel like, you know, we don't feel so vulnerable. Um, Lynn, being invited to an event that I worry about going in the social time with people I don't know. Right. Everybody worries about going to events when we don't know people. Who doesn't? You know, I mean, there are some people who are like, oh, great, I'm going to meet a lot of people. Um, but there are plenty of us who have this little niggling worry or sometimes a big worry about I'm going to a place I don't know anyone. What's that going to be like for me? And um, and it is a challenge. So we have to talk to ourselves and say, OK, it's OK to be nervous. You haven't done this before. You haven't been to this place, but you've tried other things. You've had other firsts and you've been able to manage in those situations. So what is some, what is a tool or a strategy that you had there that you could apply here? Um, Mike, I used to binge eat, but I realized binge eating gave my brain the dopamine that it needed. Binge eating is basically non-existent, right? So when we binge, dopamine is at once high intensity um, feedback. So that can be food, that can be screens, that can be risky activities, it can be substance use. Um, it's, it's in, it, dopamine craves high reward activities. And we have to balance in our brains those high reward activities with those lower reward activities, like maybe a quiet reading a book or pulling weeds in the garden or um, you know, doing Sudoku. Okay, existent. Uh, Dana, fluoxetine helps you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, Jamie, I found it excellent, but do you still have to retrain your habits? Absolutely, you do. Which is it? Does it work 
stopped working or breaking old habits, only you can know that. This was pointed out to me recently. Good luck. I hope you find what you need. Yes. So it is about um, if something works, do more of it. If it's not working, how are you going to regroup and pivot? Nadine, EMDR would be useful for trauma from dealing with a high functioning until he wasn't any more alcoholic. Yes. Um, Jamie, I really appreciate your approach to human issues that as individuals, as with parenting, that there are limits of what we can and cannot do. Uh, thank you for that. You're welcome, Jamie. I mean, this is something I'm struggling with. I personally am struggling with. I'm in the sandwich generation right now. And it's 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 painful. Like I, I can't pretend that it's not. You know, um <laughs> when I went to visit my 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 parents um who live in Philadelphia, they're not married, but you know, my mom said, I said, Can I drive? She's 83. She's like, No, no, I'll drive. I can drive my car. And I'm like, okay. So we get in the car. <laughs> she turns left on the street and the street has been like divided there's like a divider that looks like this so you can go this way or you can go this way and so she goes on the wrong side of the divider into the oncoming traffic and i'm kind of freaking out in the front seat i'm like mom mom you need to get out of this lane you need to get out of this lane turn right turn right and she's like oh okay yes i know i know i've got it and there were like three other instances where she was like, you know, really kind of on somebody's tail a few times and like hit all these potholes. And all I kept saying was like, why can't I drive? Like I'm 30 years younger than you are. Let me drive your car, but wouldn't do it. And that, that was just a huge exercise in letting go. And then when I fi we finally got back home, I was like, you know, I'm going to take a little walk. <laughs> Kat, thank you for such a wonderful talk. Wondering, is it possible to develop ADHD as an adult after having a very unstable home, having to move from state to state, never going to school for a few months and had the opportunity to build relationships, asking for a friend that is in a deep depression, toxic worry, no sleep, et cetera. You know, I don't know, you, you, that's not really how ADHD works. Um, it's a biologically based disorder. 55% of people who have ADHD have a parent who's had ADHD. So um, sometimes um, life situations will uncover an ADHD that, that previously existed, but wasn't perhaps noticed or diagnosed. RSD is a real thing and not a lot of people talk about it. We'll be talking about RSD again here in, in the weeks and months to come. It's very important. Um, thank you, thank you, Tina. Deb, yes, it is. I had three episodes at work. I knew intellectually a coworker would never hurt my feelings, but emotionally, I could not handle the feeling that he did. I generally just need to withdraw from the situation until I can get rid of my emotional pain. Right. So we have to figure out how to soothe ourselves, and we need to teach our kids how to do that, too, because that's the only thing that's going to help us. What helps soothe me? Do I want to talk to someone? Do I need to see if what I'm experiencing actually really happened, or was it my perception that something was off? what can we do? And recently I had a friend tell me that something I said while they were at my house to um, one of my kids was critical and judgmental. And uh, this friend told me that when I was already feeling bad about something else. And I basically said to them, I need to go. I have to have a cry. <laughs> so I hung up the phone and I went into my house and I sat on my sofa and I had a little cry. And then they texted and said, I'm sorry, that was not okay for me to do when you were feeling that way. I'm like, thank you, because it really wasn't, right? So it's hard. Sometimes when we're in pain, like we, we, we turn to someone, but then actually sometimes they can make it worse. So we want to um, just stay with ourselves and figure out what's going to help soothe us. Susan, is there a better word than perfectionism? Since I don't think of perfect when I look at the clutter, the word just seems wrong. You know, you can come up with any word you want. Uh, I think that's that's really uh, kind of up to you. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, you could come up with, um, I don't know, I can't say for you. I think you should figure that out. You're welcome, Deb. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, great, Karen, I'm glad. Fabiola, thank you, you're welcome. 
the binge eating is one of my biggest challenges, but it's affecting my health, but I can't seem to stop. So Fabiola, what I would do is really encourage you to um, to, jo to to seek a support group, um, uh, and whether it's Overeaters Anonymous or um, a support group, an online support group that's offered by you know any any um, you know really eating disorder clinic, they offer a lot of them, um, is very helpful. Um, there is a great book called When Too Much Is Never Enough, which is about ADHD and eating disorders or um, risky behaviors or substance use, you might want to check that out. Monica, my dad is showing signs of dementia. He still drives around our small town, but I won't get in the car with him. Okay, there you go. A good talk. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Alethea, I used to r refuse, <laughs> I refused to ride or let my loved ones ride with my mother-in-law until we could talk her out of driving. Hey, you know, I, I'm not far from that, but my father was a car dealer and he's going to drive till, you know, his license is forcibly taken away. All right, I'm going to take a couple more of these. Uh, Andy, hi. I was diagnosed in December at the age of 37 with, oops, where did it go? Okay, with general anxiety and just never had it treated properly. Now I've been going to occupational therapy, regular therapy, DBT works well. DBT is fantastic. It's dialectical behavior therapy. It's also a great thing for trauma and, um, and for uh, managing big emotions and a psychiatrist. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, your Ahmed, thank you for sharing. Um, okay, I think I have gotten to all of the comments, which is fantastic. So thank you so much for joining me today. This was a very uh, lively and honest conversation. I really appreciate all your sharing. Thank you for, to for tolerating my little storytelling. And part of the reason I do that storytelling is so you can understand that I am actually no different than you are. Uh, this is my area of expertise and my, my professional field, but as a person, I still have my warts and I'm working on accepting them. So thank you so much for joining me. I will see you in two weeks. I love this community and I hope that you all have um, a peaceful rest of your day and a good weekend. Thank you, Monica. Yes, support groups are great. It's where we all have this social contract to hold space for each other around a specific issue saves a lot of pain and misunderstanding. Agreed. Thank you, bye-bye.